Hey, my name is Wes. In this video, we're going to talk about analog to digital conversion. The following slides of this lecture will define what an analog to digital converter is, we'll define some of the use cases, some examples, and go over the different types and their pros and cons. An analog to digital converter is a device that measures some analog voltage and converts it into a digital representation, which can then be used by some computing systems such as a microcontroller or microprocessor to perform calculations or make decisions for a program. Another device known as a digital to analog converter or DAC does the opposite of an ADC. It converts a digital value into an analog voltage. DACs will be discussed in another lecture. Once we process some data digitally, we may wish to re-output it back to the analog domain. An example of this would be digital signal processing. We can convert an analog signal into a digital form using an ADC, then do some processing such as adding effects like echoes, etc., and then re-output it as an analog signal again to go to speakers to be heard. Now let's talk about why we need ADCs in the first place. Most physical properties in the world we live in, such as light, temperature, and sound, are analog in nature. Devices such as sensors are used to measure and quantify these physical properties. This is a very common use case for analog to digital converters. Data from these sensors, which is often output as analog voltage levels, can be converted and stored digitally for computation. Now let's talk about some real world high level applications that may utilize ADCs. Temper sensors, which could be used in refrigeration, Things like measuring car oil temperatures, thermostats in your home HVAC systems. Light sensors are very common as well. These can be used for anything from night lights to the screen on your laptop or your keyboard automatically dimming or getting brighter. Distance sensors can be used in anything like autonomous systems. So a Roomba vacuum cleaner, making sure it doesn't you know, run off of the, uh, your stairs or run into a wall. Flex sensors and strain gauges are used to measure force, so for things like uh, to detect how much power something is exerting. Microphones are used to sample audio, so if you talk into a microphone, some analog signal is generated, and then an ADC can pick that up and then convert it into a digital representation. Potentiometers are used everywhere. Um, most like volume knobs or frequency tuning knobs for a radio, they usually are, are uh, consisting of potentiometers. And then joysticks, you may not think at first, but most joysticks are actually two or more potentiometers that are used, one per axis of the joystick. So as you tilt the joystick forward, you're just moving or rotating a potentiometer. And a potentiometer is, is a variable resistance, so it creates a voltage divider. And that voltage divider changing creates a variable analog signal that can be interpreted by an ADC. And then battery charging, which is more and more common nowadays. Um, a lot of batteries will consist of multiple cells. And when you charge a battery, you want to charge each cell such that they maintain the same voltage. And one way to do that is to measure the voltage of each cell and charge each cell individually. Things like oscilloscopes or, or data acquisition in general use analog to digital converters to display analog signals on a digital screen. Moving on, we'll introduce some fundamental concepts that will be required to learn about ADCs. An electrical signal carries information in the form of voltages. There are two relevant domains we will discuss, analog and digital. The analog domain consists of a continuous, infinite range of voltage values, and the digital domain consists of discrete values stored using a finite number of bits. As you should already know, a digital n-bit number can represent two to the n different values. Before we get into specific details regarding ADC conversions, let's look at an example to put certain concepts into perspective. In this example, say we have a caterpillar and we wish to measure its length. We have a 10 centimeter ruler with a tick mark every centimeter, as you can see on the right, and we can only choose one of these discrete centimeter marks as our measurement. In this case, we would most likely choose four centimeters since it's what looks like the closest to the caterpillar's head. If the caterpillar is actually 3.7 centimeters long, then we would have about 0.3 centimeters of error. Now let's try to measure the same exact caterpillar again using a ruler that has tick marks every millimeter, but is still a total of 10 centimeters long. This ruler has a higher resolution, which allows for more accurate measurements, in this case down to the millimeter instead of centimeter. 
While a higher resolution ruler such as this can measure in millimeters, it also takes a little bit longer for us to produce the result. You'll see that ADCs have similar trade-offs. Measuring the caterpillar's length in these examples shares some concepts with analog to digital converters. In the case of the caterpillar, we had to choose a discrete length measurement to represent a continuous or actual length measurement. And for ADCs, we have to map a continuous and infinite range of voltage values into a discrete set of digital values. Now into more specific numerical examples regarding ADCs. Imagine we needed to measure a signal that could consist of voltage values between 0 and 1 volt. In this diagram, you can see that a 2-bit digital number can represent four different voltage values. We are converting these analog values into digital values consisting of 2 bits. This would cause our smallest distinguishable voltage increment to be 0.25 volts, which in this case is relatively huge for this range of values. Any voltage measured between 0 and 1 volt can be mapped to one of these four binary values. For example, the binary value 00, 0 corresponds to 0 volts, and the binary value 11 1 corresponds to 1 volt. Now let's do another example where we use 3-bit resolution instead of 2. With 3 bits for the digital values, we can represent 8 different voltage levels. This means that for every digital value, we can detect an increment of 0.125 volts in the analog domain. The higher the number of bits we use, the higher the resolution of the ADC, and the finer the voltage change we can detect. 2 and 3-bit ADCs are not very common, they're just being shown for illustrational purposes. A more common resolution for an ADC is 12 bits, but many different resolutions are used. For a 12-bit resolution, there would be 2 to the 12 or 4096 unique values that could be measured. For a range of 0 volts to 1 volt, a 12-bit ADC could theoretically measure values in 244 microvolt increments. Two of the many factors that dictate how accurate an ADC can be are the following. The full-scale range, or FSR, which is the full range of voltages that an ADC can convert, and the resolution, which is the total number of bits used to represent every digital value. Resolution is also commonly denoted by delta. The smallest change in voltage that an ADC can distinguish is the full-scale range divided by the number of different values that the digital result could represent. The concept of mapping a continuous range of values such as voltages to a discrete range such as our digital values is commonly referred to as quantization. Quantization is necessary for us to be able to perform ADC conversions. Most of the time, each analog value cannot be perfectly mapped to a discrete digital value. And the difference between the actual value and the discrete value that's chosen is called the quantization error. This can be compared to when we measured the length of the calculator and we had to choose either 3 or 4 centimeters. In that case, our quantization error was the difference between the discrete value at 4 centimeters and the actual value of the caterpillar's length, which was 3.7 centimeters. Using a higher resolution ADC or using more, more bits in the digital represented value generally yields, yields lower quantization errors, but also increases conversion times and hardware cost. An ideal ADC has a linear mapping between analog and digital values. In general, we desire some equation that allows us to interpret the digital or analog values and map to the other domain. For our purposes, this is simply the common linear equation of a line, y equals mx plus b, or in more meaningful terms, the following equation where AV is the analog voltage, M is the slope, DV is the converted digital value, and B is the vertical axis intersection, if applicable. Now to demonstrate the usefulness of this equation, we can do an example where we assume we're using an ADC of a 5-bit resolution, and we're using it to convert values from 0 to 5 volts. The lower bound of the full-scale range of voltage values is referred to as the negative reference voltage, and the upper bound of the full-scale range is referred to as the positive reference voltage. If we choose our digital values to be in an unsigned format, then our range is 0 to 31. We can calculate the maximum value with this equation, as you should already know. As shown in this diagram, we can draw a line that connects the points with the digital value 0 and 0 volts to the digital value of 31 corresponding to 5 volts. We can then calculate the slope of this line to fill in our equation as follows. And then in this example, our linear equation will end up being y equals 5 over 31 times x or 
the analog value will be the slope times the digital value. Note that in this case, the vertical intercept is zero since our line passes through the origin. If we wanted to calculate the corresponding voltage value of a converted digital value, we could do as follows. Let's do an example where we have the digital value of nine that was a result from the ADC. We could determine the voltage by plugging it into the equation. In this case, we would get a value of 1.45 volts for a digital value of nine. In some cases, it may be useful to store the digital results in a signed or twos complement format. In the next slide, we'll start an example where we have a full scale voltage range that includes negative values, such as negative five volts to positive five volts, and we represent the digital values in a signed five bit format. So in this example, we'll draw a line between the points negative 16 and negative five volts and 15 and five volts. Calculating the slope, we get a similar result of 10 over 31. And our linear equation will be as follows. In this case, since the line does not pass through the origin, there's a vertical offset. To calculate this, we can just plug in a known point on the line, either negative 16, negative five volts, or 15 and five volts, and then we would get a result of B equaling 0.161 volts. This is a relatively small voltage, but depending on the application, it may, it may be significant. In the following slides, we'll talk about some of the popular analog to digital converter types, as well as some of their pros and cons some of which will be the successive approximation ADC, sigma delta variant, dual slope, as well as flash. Successive approximation register ADCs use the binary search algorithm to compute each bit of a binary digital conversion, one at a time. They consist of four main components, a sample and hold circuit that basically takes a snapshot of an analog signal at some point in time and tries to hold the value as stable as possible while the analog conversion takes place a DAC that generates the analog voltages to compare against the analog input voltage that's being measured, and a comparator that actually executes these comparisons. And finally, the successive approximation register and its associated logic is in charge of implementing the binary search algorithm. It updates the DAC with a new value for each bit that it calculates and contains the full digital result after the algorithm is complete. Next, we'll see some more details by showing a simple example. Here's an example where a successive approximation ADC tries to measure a 1 volt signal with a full scale range from 0 volts to 5 volts. First, the initial value of the successive approximation register is half of the maximum digital value. In this case, that would be 8 because we have a 4 bit ADC. This digital value is written to the DAC, which corresponds to 2.5 volts. This then gets fed into the comparator, where it is compared to the analog input signal of one volt. And because one volt is less than 2.5 volts, the first bit, or the most significant bit, is set to zero in the digital result. If it was greater than 2.5 volts, this bit would be set to a one. For the next bit to be converted, we'll use the value four, because it's halfway between the previous value of eight and zero. This corresponds to 1.25 volts when it gets sent to the DAC. The comparator then compares the 1 volt analog input to this 1.25 volt signal coming from the DAC. And because 1 is still less than 1.25 volts, the second bit is also a 0. The next voltage we compare is 0.625 volts. And in this case, the analog input voltage of 1 volt is actually greater than 0.625 volts. Therefore, the bit that we're converting is set to a one in the result. For the last bit, we choose the value of three because it's halfway between the previous values four and two. The digital value of three corresponds to 0.9375 when sent to the DAC. In this case, the comparator sees that one volt, which is the analog input, is greater than the digital comparison value. And because of this, the last bit in the result will be set to a one. Note that the value we end up with is not exactly 1 volt, but rather 0.9375 volts. This difference is caused by quantization, as we mentioned previously. If we used a higher bit count ADC, the process would take even longer, but we would get to a more accurate result in the end. Sigma delta ADCs use oversampling and digital filters to measure analog signals instead of comparators, like in the successive approximation 
uh, ADCs. The theory behind them is more complex than other ADCs because digital processing is required. Pros are that it can be very accurate and that it is not very expensive to produce. Cons is that it is, has low to medium conversion rates when compared to other ADCs. Dual slope ADCs use analog integration circuitry to integrate the input voltage for a fixed amount of time and then the reference voltage is deintegrated. The mathematical relationship between the time to integrate the input voltage and the time to deintegrate the reference voltage can be used to produce a digital representation. Pros are the accuracy and the cost effectiveness, and the cons are that it has relatively low conversion rates. Flash ADCs use a very accurate resistor ladder to generate a series of sub-reference voltages that can be compared to the analog input voltage simultaneously using comparators in parallel. Using a priority encoder, the outputs of all these comparators are encoded into a binary representation. It can be thought of as a fully parallelized version of the successive approximation ADC we covered earlier. It is extremely fast because all of the bits are calculated in the same operation, and it is as accurate as the individual components it's comprised of, such as the resistors and comparators. Due to the fact that it requires two to the n comparators for an n-bit implementation, it can be extremely hardware intensive and therefore very costly. Here's a graph that shows the throughput capabilities of each ADC with respect to its resolution or the number of bits that it calculates. You can see that the dual slope ADC on the left is normally pretty slow, but it can be extremely accurate when implemented correctly. Uh, on the other side of the spectrum, the flash ADCs have extremely high throughputs but resolution goes down due to the number of hardware requirements. Sigma Delta and successive approximation ADCs are somewhere in the middle and spread out throughout the range because they're very flexible. To conclude, I'd just like to reemphasize that analog to digital converters are a very crucial part of embedded systems. They allow us to indirectly measure physical properties around us and produce the results in a digital format that we can use in digital computing systems, such as microcontrollers, microprocessors, or even larger computers.